Good morning and welcome to the Amarillo Evangelical Baptist Mission. It's good to have everybody here this morning. Um, it's a nice day outside. It's going to get even nicer. Amen. Uh, this morning is we just kind of get ready for some praise and worship music and then it's time to the Word of God. I would like to ask that you think about all of the different uh, fire victims right now wow. uh, all around. Um, there was another fire in the River Road area last night um, out that way anyways and so I don't know what kind of devastation it caused but I know this other this other massive fire is still very much so ablaze and they're calling in uh, firefighters from all surrounding cities and neighborhoods to try to put this thing out so be in prayer for them um, you know people lose all kinds of things we had some people lose lives some people lost their house their business so be in prayer for them uh, that God would just show them how to get back on their feet and get started again. Um, also, we have some of our members that are uh, traveling. They're away from us this weekend. So be in prayer for Weldon and Cora Freeman. I'm sorry. Well, Weldon and Kathy Freeman. I'm so sorry. I don't even I guess that just rolled out. Rolled out. Uh, anyways, it's good to, good to be here again this morning. And we thank you for coming out. And uh, here in just a second, like I said, we're going to jump into praise and worship, but Brother Gary, will you open us up in prayer? No, I think I can. <laughs> okay, you can do whatever. Well, I just want to thank you for this wonderful morning for just bringing us all together. Father, this morning I pray for Weldon and Kathy, God, that you your, 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 have your protection from around them. And Father, the, 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 they will have a nice visit and do what needs to be done. And Father, when they come back, that you would protect them on the way. Father, bless Kyle as well. He gives your word and speak to our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you just burn with inside of us your fire. Burn with inside of us your fire. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. So let's dive into that praise and worship. Let's try to find my bells. Thank you. 
food start. Yes, sir. How do you say hallelujah in Chinese? <laughs> you got me there. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> I can say hallelujah the same in every language. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was like, I was like, he's got me there. I don't have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're just joining us, it's good to have you. I can't, I don't know what screen is it's on. It's blank. There. It's just blank. So right there. There you go. Okay, so it's good to have you all with us. Uh, I'm still getting used to it where I can't see it, but I'm trying to put it out there where everybody else can. And, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, when you get on with us um, and you watch us on Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday or any other day of the week that it's like living room worship. And so we're literally in the living room worshiping this morning. So that's kind of cool. Um, but it's about wherever you are. Uh, yeah. You can sing almost wherever you are. I don't know if they allow that at your job or, or wherever you might be. But if it, if they do and you feel inclined to worship the Lord, I suggest you do it. Have fun with it. And let other people think you're crazy for a little while until they until they feel led by that same Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then all of a sudden there's a few of you crazy. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump in this morning. Try to start with some positive social media. And so one of the hardest things to do, but the things we need to remind ourselves to do uh, most often is to just simply put God first. Amen. Put God first. Uh, it's no secret to anybody, I love the water, so that, that just matters a little bit more to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, secondly, uh, you know we were talking last week about, about the lamps and the oil and so we're going to jump into this. Look, you're going to you're going to need oil in your lamp. It's getting dark out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked a question last week. Gary presented that to me. Just kind of what did that mean? And I kind of I kind of dug in uh, a little further. And found this. I I believe based on what I've read that the oil in your lamp is the word of your heart, the word that you carry with you. And I feel like the word went on to kind of confirm that. Check this one out here. It says in Psalm, Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. In Psalm 119, 105. So I like how those kind of go together and flow together a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I hope this is true of us. I hope we're not just reading and, and that it actually matters to us. But check this one out. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Also, Psalm 119, verse 16. Uh, did you know? And this, this is conviction for me, it has been conviction for me, but that when we're not in the Word, we're actually neglecting the Word. And I've neglected the Word many a time, so this this is not a point at anybody. This is just hopefully conviction that, that God will just call us uh, to make to make time and to make uh, Him and His Word a priority. Uh, but we're going to dig into that even more here in just a minute. So, uh, And then, then I've got one more for you this morning. I did five today. Uh, and I like this one. It says, when you pray, God isn't impressed with tons of words. He listens to your heart. Amen. Isn't it, isn't it great that uh, God can listen to you even if you feel like you're not as intelligent as somebody else or whatever? I feel that way. I mean, I feel like, you know, if this is an intelligence contest, I lost already, right? So I'm grateful that I can just be me and just be honest and come from the heart and say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I do know I need you. So I believe that's a really good starting point. Y'all ready to dive into the Word? Let's go into some questions here. Uh, first question, if we as Christians are truly desiring to live out the will of God, how would we go about doing that? How would we do that? I, I have a lot of people that I hear ask, what is God's will for my life? And God's will for our lives, although there are different, I'm going to call, I'm going to call them little things, but I don't think that they're, they're unimportant things, okay? But God's will for our lives is pretty much all the same, really. But there's going to be different people that he calls you to, different situations he's going to use you to minister through, and so those things will be different. However, uh, how, we, how we worship him and lift him up before other people is virtually identical no matter where we are. Okay, uh, we're going to cover that in just a second. If Jesus was going to be coming through your town, like if you knew Jesus was coming out of here, uh, 
what would you do to make sure you got to see him? Yeah, what, what would you do? <laughs> you know, I, I know that uh, I like I like comedy. But I took Kathy and I went to a Jeff Dunham uh, show a couple of years back. Maybe it was longer. Um, but you know, we, we like to watch him, and he was in town. We got to go, and we don't get to do stuff like that all the time. But there are some things that happen. Uh, I know Matthew wants to go see. Uh, NF in concert, you know, different things that we would love to do uh, if, if the show was closed. You know, I just wonder how much more would we be willing to do whatever whatever it took, whatever was necessary to go see Jesus if he was in town. And then the last question, but not least, why are we so often unsuccessful with our witness and gospel mission? Okay? Why are we so often unsuccessful? Okay? And so we're going to cover all these uh, as we go through. And then we're also going to recap at the very end. So if you will, join with me. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Okay. If you have the Bible app on your phone, go ahead and pull it up. It's at school. I would rather you use the phone for that than to be playing a game during church. Uh, I want you to definitely be uh, invested. If you have a hard, Bible, hard copy Bible, it's good to know where to find things, how to get there, where it is. Uh, you get a lot of questions. Is that Old Testament? Is that New Testament? That is Old Testament, the very first book of the Bible. Okay. Um, and so here in uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Can y'all imagine that? Just really imagine that for a second. Does anybody in here know anybody that speaks another language? That's pretty basic, right? We all do. Everybody knows somebody. Okay. This goes on to say that there was a time in the beginning that everybody spoke one language. Doesn't go on to tell us what, what language that was, but we can maybe guess Hebrew. I, I don't know. But, but we know it was one language. Okay? <coughs> and I, I think how crazy that would have been. Like It would have been nice to understand everybody. Verse 2 says, As people moved eastward, they found a plain of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Why do you bake bricks? Why well, do you fix and build something, right? Okay. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They really believed that if they didn't settle somewhere, that everybody would just kind of be tossed somewhere. Okay. And so they wanted to build themselves a city. This is this is for us. But you notice the glory here was their glory. It was all about them. It's all about us. It's about look what we can do for us. Okay? And the attitude was not at all look what we can do for him. Right? Look what we can do for God. And so you'll see here in a, in verse 5 that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And I really want to fix in on that one word. There's one word in that whole text, and I'm not saying that the verse loses importance. It certainly does not. I'm not here to try to take away from the word of God. But the word I'm going to point out this morning is the word plan. Y'all see that word plan? Nothing they plan to do would be impossible for them. I want that to just kind of resonate in the back of our mind somewhere as it will come up again. All right? But, okay, so a lot of people get kind of mixed up on verse 5. They're like, the Lord had to come down and see it. Did he not know they were doing it? Of course he did. Okay? He came down to be amongst them, so they saw that he was looking at it. He's looking at what they're doing. Wow, okay. All right? As if anybody could ever build anything that would ever reach the heavens. You know? The heavens is far enough. I mean, we, we, we can't just get on a on a rocket and go to heaven. Right? It's not going to happen. So he came down amongst the people to see it. And it says, verse 7, Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. That's that kind of crazy? And that's kind of how I feel sometimes now when I'm at, when I'm at work, when I'm out and about. Uh, anybody ever go to knock on someone's door? And try to invite somebody to church that didn't speak English at all. Yeah. 
okay? Um, and, and it is hard. But those people that speak different languages are not any less important. They're all very important, and God created all of them, has a plan and a purpose for all of us. So the people that speak another language are no different, right? Exactly the same. But if people plan to work together and to understand each other and to maybe even learn a little bit of that basic language, they would have uh, an entryway into conversation to share the gospel with. Isn't that cool? So... Uh, here's that question I'm going to ask you, but do we plan to do it, to do that? Is that part of our plan? And then verse 8 says, So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babylon, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. It was kind of like their fear their initial fear of what they thought would happen if they didn't build a city is what ended up happening to them anyways. Right? I'll let your fear come to life. Now what will you do? <laughs> and so it's interesting. Uh, I was I was studying on this and uh, according to some internet sources, which I don't put much much stake in, they were saying that this was a parable. I don't believe it's a parable. No, I believe this is <laughs> real life. Definitely happened. Um, and, and I don't even know how many languages there are in the world, but there are many. Okay? And we see that just in our going out and being in Amarillo, we see that. So imagine what's out there that we don't know about. Yes, sir. Hey, you know, I did a study on that bat, the Tower of Babel. And, uh, and uh, the research I've come up with said that, that uh, it was over, it was about a uh, mile and a half tall. Oh wow! Yeah, and see when when it got got destroyed, it, it come crumbling down just like what well, Jericho. Yeah. And the other study I did now now where the Tower of Babel fell, that's where the I guess the uh, residents that lived that's where they went and got the brick to build the cities. Oh okay. Off that Tower of Babel. Yeah. And but, I, but it was it was, it was about. A, not one one point five miles which is a mile and a half of it. That's big. Yeah. What do you think about what do you think about the building being built with tar? Alright, instead, instead, instead of using water they use tar. Tar in between the bricks to glue everything down. That tell you that whatever we go through today ain't new. <laughs> That's sure right. That is sure right. Absolutely. Well, then we're going to jump into Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. And I believe we'll be on the New Testament the rest of the morning. But I thought it was interesting to talk about that, to talk about the next point. So in Luke 19, verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Okay. Um, so we don't know much but we know that Zacchaeus obviously heard about Jesus. Okay, somewhere along the way, he had heard about him. Uh, maybe heard some of the words, the miracles, I, I don't really know. Could have even heard part of the Messiah <coughs> message. Um, and knew that he was coming through town and was going to do whatever he could soon. Okay? And I like, I like this story because I just, I just think of, of us, like in today's time. Verse 5. When Jesus reached uh, reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. <laughs> so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Like do you do you think that there was any any shock in the fact that Jesus knew his name? Because Zacchaeus is like, who told you who I was? Yeah. Probably a little bit, but I think it, I think Zacchaeus was already was already curious. 
was already curious if everything was true, if everything was right. I think when he called him by name, without anybody being like, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree, you silly guy. <laughs> Jesus walks by, stops, looks up. Zacchaeus, come down here. Yeah. Wow. Recognition, confirmation that I am who I say I am because I know everything before I even get there. Um, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I like that too. Verse 7 says, All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. I don't know about y'all, but I'm grateful that he did. Yeah, yeah. If, if he did it, uh, none of us had a chance. Okay. So praise the Lord. Verse 8, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Okay. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, may not be that difficult to give somebody something that you took from them, but to give it back to them four times what you took from them, that means it's coming out of your pocket. That's coming out of your money. Okay? Coming out of your possessions, your things. Yeah, I, I, love, how, I love how Jesus answers. Uh, verse 9 said, Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Okay. So I put the word discussion right there. I hope we would be able to talk about that. Anybody who says, what is the will of God in my life? Well, God wants you to know who he is. God wants to have a relationship with you. But even more than that, he desires in his will for us to be actively seeking and saving the lost. It's one of the things we're called to do. People say, well, how do you do that? Well, you share the gospel message with them. And then God is the one that calls them unto himself. We, we don't have that ability. We're, we're not able to be like, hey, uh, uh, let's call him real quick. I'll put you on the phone with God. <laughs> Didn't work that way. But God calls you unto himself. So if you have even so much as an inclination or a curiosity about him, that's him calling you. That's not us calling you to him. Okay. And sometimes people get that twisted up. They say, they say, look at all these people that I saved. And we didn't save them. We, we can't even save ourselves. Yes, sir. Yeah, I like people say that. Say, I saved someone. Well, they don't, they don't do nothing. Yeah. They could have been somewhere on down the line that planted a seed. And that person comes to you and starts talking. Yeah. And then the seed probably took effect. Yeah. And you were talking to them. Yeah. The seed. Uh, God did all the, all the saving, not you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we can learn a lot from the word about it's just carrying the seed yeah. and not, not watching for a harvest that doesn't belong to us, you know. Uh, but if we feel like we personally save anybody, we're fooling ourselves. That's right. uh, but we do have a job to do, and that's part of the will of God is for us to be out there sharing the word with people, loving people, caring about people, trying to meet, you know, basic needs where we can. And so uh, there's definitely something to that. Okay. Moving on from there into Matthew uh, 22, 34 through 40. Now I was going to do the uh, the part from uh, from Mark, but uh, decided against it. Uh, if you go to uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see the uh, the same story, obviously told from a different point of view, but it's the exact same story. Uh, it's just basically it's eyewitness testimony that they were all there. But uh, my Bible had a note in there that some of the transcripts from uh, that part of Mark had either been lost or misplaced or something. So I was like, okay, well, let's let's go to Matthew then. We'll go ahead and get Matthew's version of events. And so right here, uh, Matthew 22, 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. Everybody stopped right there. They're like, of course they did. <laughs> sure they did. Uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were out to get Jesus from the first time they ever saw him. Yeah. Okay, they, could, they couldn't stand him. They couldn't stand his message. They couldn't stand his truth. And every time they tried to come against him publicly, they lost. I like that. <laughs> they lost. And it wasn't because uh, Jesus was some kind of master cage fighter and he beat them all up. It's just that they would they would try to stumble him with words and, and uh, you know his responses to things and his responses were always perfect 
His, yeah. his word about his father was always right on the money. Right on the money. And they didn't know what to do with it. And so rather than try to understand that this is who he says he is, let's say, well, we'll just get him. We'll find a way to get him, right? And we're talking about getting, just to be clear, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him for the first moment. And so they were trying to find things to charge him with. They wanted to hit him with blasphemy. That's what they were after. So they wanted him to speak out of turn. They could never get him to do it because he's God. <laughs> Amen? So verse 35 says, one of them, and you'll love this, an expert in the law tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And I'm glad that you've got your, your hard copy because I closed mine. I have that open. All right, I'm going to ask you to do something here in just a second. Verse 37 says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Okay? Those are the hardest commandments ever. I hope everybody's hearing this. We can read that and say, you know what, I read it. It's not enough to read it. You have to believe it. Uh -huh. And then when you believe it, it's not just enough to believe it. Now it's time to live it. Yeah. Okay? And that, that's the part that's hard. And so um, sometimes the reason that our witness, our gospel witness is not successful is because we're not successful in one, planning, but in two, following through with the word. This is, this is part of that will of God thing again. Okay? Why would he care that we knew the greatest two commandments ever if he didn't want us to partake and, and live that way? He would have. He would. I mean, you notice when he's walking, he doesn't just say, the grass over here is a shade of magenta because it's unimportant. It's irrelevant. When Jesus spoke, it had purpose and meaning and definition every time. He never wasted words. Never. And so if he's telling us we're loving God with everything we're possibly able to give God, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, that is not an easy thing to do. You know, one of the things I was convicted about even yesterday was I, it, we pray for uh, healing, and we pray for restoration, we pray for grace, and we pray for all kinds of things. And it finally, finally made sense to me yesterday what it means to actually pray for the will of God to be done. And it's whatever he has to do with it, whatever he's going to do with it, and our ability to trust whatever that is even if it's something that at that moment we don't love. I was, I was uh, sharing last week, if you remember, uh, previous to that, I was listening to some radio gospel messages uh, on the way to or away from work. And uh, one of the gentlemen I was listening to, he said, uh, he said, I was always raised not to ever be mad at God. And he's like, he's like but I struggled with that because there were times I was mad at God. And he said, and then as I read... Uh, from the different writers in Scripture, I learned that I wasn't the only one that had ever been mad at God. There were lots of writers of the Scripture that were mad at God. Okay? But, even in their anger, they basically asked for the ability to simmer down, calm down, and learn to trust Him. They weren't in love with what He was doing. In fact, that's one of the hardest things to live through is not knowing what God's doing in your life. Not having any idea. Lord, I have no idea where, like, like I'll be honest about our church. I have no idea where this is going. I have no idea where it's going. But I don't have to. I have to trust him to show us. To show us where it's going. And then be faithful and obedient to go do something with that. Which is what this is all about this morning. Look here. Question for you. Uh, or just a statement. We would literally have to work and even knowing our neighbors. I'm thinking about like my neighborhood right here, and I'm not even talking about just your physical neighbor, the person that lives next to you, but we're, we're also caught up in this electronic phase. Like everywhere we go, we got one of these plugged to our face. Yeah, that's true. And it's, it's so hard for us to even notice other people are in the same room with us. 
And I don't know about your residential neighborhood, but I know that mine, very rarely do we even see people come out of their house. We have a lot of recluses in this neighborhood. I don't know if they're couch potatoes or not. I've, I've not gotten that close to them. But very rarely do I see any of my neighbors come outside unless they're going somewhere. I assume they're going to work, coming home from work, but we're, we're not, we don't, we've never had a block party since we've been here. I, I can't tell you the name of the guy who lives right across the street because I, I don't ever really see him. It's so quiet, you know, they have Christmas lights. Yeah. yeah. So it's quiet. It's a quiet neighborhood. And though I like that sometimes, I hate that other times. I'm like, I'm like, show me signs of life. It's like when you go to a church and there's a lot of kids, you have some of the senior folks that are so irritated because they're loud. But that sound is joyful to me. Yeah. I'm like, that's that's future, that's future uh, witness right there. Yeah. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah, I think it thrills me a lot of those oh kids across the street. I just love watching them have a good time. Men are out there jumping and screaming, hollering, they don't as much as I, <laughs> I just love watching them. Yeah, there's a lot of people in church settings that can't stand that. Right? But, but you should. Because, listen, that's two things. One, that's the future. That's the future leadership of churches. That's the future gospel leadership to people. That's, that's honestly, so if you've noticed here in, 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 in your regular church congregations, one of the biggest group of people that's missing, I would say, is anybody from ages probably 20 to 50. Ages 20 to 50 are generally missing from all the churches. There are very few couples that you will see in that, in that, in that age bracket. And I believe personally that the kids are the way to the parents. Like if you set a child's heart on fire for the Lord, I think a child's going to get mom and dad interested at the very least. That's right. I'll thank that. Do what? Parents will see a change in their kids. Oh, yeah. And they'll find a seat. Yeah, it's, it, like, like Gary said, you know, it's not our job to know when God's going to sprout that thing into full effect, but it is our job to plan. Right? And, and then remember that the harvest isn't ours. If somebody's saved because you shared the gospel with them, it's because God saved them, not because we did. All right? Very important. Uh, Matthew, again, 28, verses 16 through 20. Oh, uh, Gary, what I was going to ask you to do a second ago is if you kept going from where I just was, it said that no one dared to ask him any more questions. After, after he had shut down the, the, the Pharisees, yeah. it says that no one dared to ask him any more questions. Because they basically felt like they had said, the smartest guy they had, the most knowledgeable guy they had at Jesus, and they're like, all right, get him! And when he got done talking to Jesus, it... Jesus politely and lovingly shut him down and nobody else had the goal to try. They were like, that's it. That's it. If he, if he couldn't do it, ain't nobody going to get it done. So they gave up. Right? They realized that trying to catch this guy in a blasphemous scheme is, has no value whatsoever. Matthew 28, verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a second. How hard is it to worship Jesus when you doubt him? It's, it's, it's near impossible. Lord, I'm worshipping you because I kind of think you're God, but I'm not sure. It doesn't work like that. And, and faith is hard. It's, it's believing in something that you can't readily see right in front of you. But I, I believe that there's also a lot of feeling that comes with that. Um, like I, I feel God around me and different things that are happening. I feel the presence of God in, in my life around other people. I feel the conviction of God uh, both, both through my mind, my heart, and through other people. When people speak to me, I know that God sent them to deliver a message to me, whether they know it or not. There's sometimes somebody will say something to me that I know was him. I know it was him. And I'm just, <laughs> you know, God is so mysterious and, he, and he's so right in front of us. And so many times if we're caught up in the world, we miss it. 
just completely missed. Uh, one thing, you know, that's why we need to have fellowship with other believers because, like us here, it, it's uh, the spirit in y'all, the spirit in me is all together. Yeah. And your spirit helps me to grow. And y'all's spirit helps me to grow. That's why we need to be together on the spirit. Oh, yeah. If you get to believe what I have to say. Yeah, you got to start. There's that, there's that saying, one and all crop apples go the whole bunch. Yeah. That's exactly true. Yeah. And, and if you're. If you're in a mindset that you're going to be around a bunch of non-believers and hope to change them, it's probably not going to happen. But it could ruin you. I, I say that you try to witness, uh, keep that constant connection to God. Don't ever try to unplug for it because that didn't work. No. And uh, just continue to witness, love them, pray for them. Uh, you know, if they do the wrong thing, try to love them anyways. Um, and, and the word kind of speaks to some of that. That uh, you can publicly rebuke. People, I think the word says twice, and then after that have nothing to do with it. If you go into a church, I'm going to say a, a church, and they're practicing a message, and the message is not biblically sound, I, I, I say you publicly rebuke. And if you publicly rebuke according to the word twice, then have nothing to do with it. Be done right there and leave. Okay? Right here it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him with some doubt him. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Where's the will of God in your life? It's right there. Okay? Uh, go, go and share the word with people. Make disciples. A disciple is a follower of Christ. You're giving them the information. You're not trying to sell them oceanfront property. You're not trying to get them to, build, to buy into your, to your golf resort club. You're trying to share with them eternal salvation. Okay? You're trying to share them with the relationship of God, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the freedom that exists only through Him. Okay? Um, now, some people are going to reject that word. And sometimes it's going to make you feel kind of personal about it. Like it's going to bother you personally. You can't let that happen either. Uh, listening again to that, the radio service talking about people that like to try to lead people to Christ by arguing with them. That leads very few people to Christ. You know, I, I think you could say if somebody has just completely taken out of context the word of God and they're trying to uh, explain this stuff to you, you can say, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not what, the, not what was meant by that. They say, well, yeah, well, it says this, this, and this. Now, I'll tell you what, we can study together if you want to, but I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna sit here and argue with you over it. Like, I care too much about you and myself to do that. Right? You know, maybe pray that God will speak to both of us and help us to work through that relationship together where it's positive and glorifying to Him not just a fight uh, amongst two people that leads to nothing. That argument more than what no at all, at all. Yeah. Okay, so baptism. Let's look at this verse nineteen talking about being baptized. Baptism does not save you. Okay, baptism doesn't save you. However, baptism is that public profession of faith. It's it's a symbolic of of dying, going underwater, dying to yourself, and being born again in Christ. You're basically dying with Him. On the cross and the death, the burial and the resurrection. Right? That's what it's symbolic of. Um, there's nothing special about the water. It's not going to turn you into a transformer. <laughs> okay? But it, but it is it is symbolic in its public profession. In front of everybody in the room or in everybody that's around strangers alive, you say, you know what? I believe that God is, is the only God, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And through him is the only way I can have salvation. The only way to get to the Father is through the Son. When you say that publicly, then you come forward and you you you, you live in that demonstration of, of that profession of faith. Okay? Um, the Word says that if you publicly acknowledge me before others, I, talking about Jesus, I will publicly acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. Yeah. But if you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I tell you what, I don't know about y'all, and I'm not trying to throw a threat, I, but 
The Word of God does warn us very sternly that if you want to be acknowledged before God, then you should probably acknowledge Him before men. Right? So that, that would be my that be my warning to everybody. So if we as Christians are truly desiring to live out the will of God, how would we do that? Well, we would desperately read these verses and spend time in close prayer with the Lord. We would read the word and stop neglecting it. Okay? Now when I say that, that, that is definitely a conviction of myself. Oh man, yeah, for sure. The second question we had is, if Jesus was going to be coming through your town, what would you do to make sure you got to see him? And I think the most basic answer is anything and everything. <laughs> like, like you, you, you'd say, hey, I, I need Friday off. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and just take a whole week because I, I don't know how he's going to be here. But while he's here, I'd like to be around. The boss says, well, sorry, I can't do it. Got three people off. Say, well, I'm telling you, I'm not going to be here Friday. <laughs> not going to be here Friday. So just so you know. Why are we so often unsuccessful with our witness and gospel mission? As Genesis 11.5 points out, we fail to plan to share the gospel. That's simply as easy as it is. We just fail, we fail to plan to do that. When we leave the house, we leave the house for multiple reasons. To go get gas. Like today, I've got to go get these water jugs refilled. We got all kinds of things that we leave the house for. But very rarely do we leave with the sole intention of sharing the gospel with somebody. And I think if we did, even if we did that with somebody else to make it a little bit more comfortable for us, I think it would really change us. We leave the house with all kinds of things to do, uh, but rarely it's one of those things uh, to share the gospel with somebody. Some of Jesus' strongest issues were not with those who didn't know him, but with those who, I should say who, not you, who misrepresented him. Okay? There were people that were trying to say, who he was and what he was about. He's like, no, no. You're trying to go through traditions and customs and that's not what I'm about. Okay, it's not what I'm about. All right? Mm -hmm. So, um, went into uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20 uh, as we prepare to close up today, uh, this morning. Verse 18 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Now you can spend a lot of time on that, because honestly, that's not the easiest thing to do in the world. And it wasn't. And they believed him. He had authority. He spoke authority, authoritatively. He spoke in such a way that they believed him. And they left. They left their trade. They left their life. They left their livelihood, their way of making money. They just left it. Set it down and left it. And went and followed him. Are we ready to become more disconnected from the world and more connected to Jesus? Are we ready to make daily plans that not only include, but make a priority of sharing the gospel message with our neighbor? If your neighbor's house was on fire, would you not knowing them be a reason for you not to try to knock on their door and save their lives? Would you say, man, their house is on fire, but I don't, I don't even know their name. I can't, can't knock on the door and not know who they are. Their house is on fire. They have a very strong likelihood, especially in the middle of the night, or maybe maybe they're asleep or napping or whatever. Maybe something else has happened. They've been hurt in the kitchen. That's what started the fire. Who knows? But you're not going to just be like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll let it get a little worse before I do it. Oh, okay, the whole roof is ablaze. All right, let's go. <laughs> I mean, come on. And knowing that somebody could potentially be going directly towards hell is the exact same is knowing that the house is on fire. 
So my question is, do we care enough to do anything about it? Do we care enough to outreach? To knock on doors and invite people to church? Do we? It's not even inviting them to our church. Look, I, I, I can't tell you, even when we were at our last church, I didn't care if they came to our church. I cared that they knew Jesus. I don't care where you go to church. I want your church to be biblically sound. And I think the only way you're going to be able to test and know that for sure is for you yourself to be in the Word and not just rely on the pastor to teach you everything. you got to be in it yourself. And you may, you may know the Word so well that when your pastor starts speaking of the world, you realize that it's not of God that's happening. And you, you publicly rebuke. You say, look, man, nowhere in this book does it say what you just said. Nowhere. And I challenge you to show it to me. And when he can't, now your whole congregation knows sums up. Okay? And honestly, I get scared to death of big churches. I, I hope that big churches are like big crowds that Jesus had following him. But I also know that big churches are a great place for people to hide. I'm going to sit towards the back of the room and hope you never call on me for anything. Nobody knows anybody. Yeah, nobody really knows anybody. And you have like two or three different masses and you know they don't want to get to know nobody. I mean, your, your pastors probably know very few names. Got a lot of neighbors in the church that you don't know. You got a lot of neighbors in the church that you don't know anything about. So like I said, even if you go to a big church, you could have hundreds of members. I'm not saying that you're going to know all of them, but you might know all their names, you know? Know some names. Like when we see people in our, and obviously we're a much smaller group, but when we get together, I've never been like, what's your name? <laughs> never done. So I would like to get that way uh, with our church. And, and the whole moral of the story this morning, that it's time for outreach, always. Outreach is not something you stop. Outreach is something that you continue to do. Because outreach is another way of sharing the gospel message. And you can invite people to come here. You can invite people to come to a church service. But you can invite people to know the Lord. Maybe we prepare together some literature and we, we, we hand it out like we used to do. I believe that, like the Word of God says, no word ever goes out and returns for return. If that's true, maybe... Maybe, you know, at our last church, we, we planted uh, what I felt like were lots of seeds, and it was discouraging to me because we didn't see a lot of fruition on it. But then God convicted me. He's like, hey, that harvest isn't yours. That harvest is mine. He's like, I didn't call you. I didn't call you for harvest. I called you to plant. You know what I mean? And so we need to be more caught up in planting because I believe that that word is going to return fulfilled. Fulfilled with what? I don't know. And guess what? It's not my business. But fulfilled to the way that God intended it for it to go out and do its job. But I'll tell you what, we'll never ever harvest anything is a bag of seed that sits in a corner and never gets planted. It'll harvest mold. Yeah. That's not any good. So we have a job to do. Everybody who, from this point on, look, and somebody might be upset that I said this, and that's okay. But nobody can leave here today going, I wonder what the will of God is. I've just shared it with you. Move. Get off your butt. Go. <coughs> Wherever you are, if you're at the grocery store, love somebody. Be nice. <coughs> I'm talking to myself when I say that, because I'm not the easiest guy to get along with at the store. You ought to see me at Walmart when I have to check out my own groceries to have somebody stand at the door and ask to see my receipt. I get frustrated. I'm like, well, if you had to check me out, you'd know everything was good. You want me to check my stuff out and I want to make sure I didn't steal anything. And I do, I get frustrated. But use that as an opportunity to, to glorify the Lord and let it change your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I need to do. I'm speaking to myself again when I say that. A lot easier said than done. No, one thing I find myself doing I don't know if it's biblical or not, but I do it anyway. Say, Gary, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's a yeah. devil behind me. <laughs> yeah. I gotta get on my own pace. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't see anything personally wrong with that. <laughs> but you really you realize for a second that uh, you've lost control of yourself, you know. 
Lord, Lord, bring me back to you. Forgive me for getting away. I, I love that old statement. Uh, a friend of ours, everybody in this room, made the statement one time, a church of the pastor. He said, if, if you're not as close to God as you'd like to be, who moved? Yeah, that's right. And it's not that God moved. He didn't, he didn't get away from you. He didn't say, so tired of you get away from me. Even though sometimes I think he honestly could. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the love that God has for us, like our song at the beginning, it blows my mind how he loves us. Wow. How he loves me. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm troubled sometimes. Sometimes I'm a pain in the, you know what? And it, it'd be easier for him to just be like, you know what? I, I'm done with you. But he doesn't. <coughs> Instead, he's hoping that with constant love, constant grace and forgiveness that we will turn to him and realize how desperately we need him. So this morning, I hope this encourages you to outreach. And even if you outreach somebody to a different church, it's all the church of God. It's all the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Every last one of them. Every, every, every group of people. I'm not going to say every building because it has nothing to do with the building. It has everything to do with the people. Okay, I hope that that encourages you to go share that gospel with somebody. You don't have to know a lot to do it. Just love somebody. Be nice. Be generous. Be kind. Be peaceful. Uh, tell them God bless you. you know, things like that. I mean, you'd be, you'd be amazed by something so small like that. But then again, going, you say, well, small. You, the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. Sometimes I wonder if I even have a mustard seed. You know? So we, we all need to be in prayer for each other, and then we all need to come together, like Gary said, and get together and, and go do it. Nothing left to do but to do it. Amen. Will y'all join me in prayer this morning? Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that has definitely not been idle, and definitely moving, very much so alive, active, Lord, changing our minds, changing our hearts. Lord, I pray that your word this morning will go out and just touch somebody's heart and let them know how much you love them and how serious the situation is. This whole, whole situation of choice, it boils down to people deciding whether or not they want to live their life for you and live an eternal paradise, or if they want to be condemned to eternal torture and damnation. And a lot of people don't even know what direction they're headed in because the, the path to destruction is so comfortable. It's so easy and it's, and it's familiar. And, and you know, sometimes it just has a, a routine to it that feels normal. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to just show your love and demonstrate your love and your kindness and your mercy, Lord, your grace and your peace in other people's lives that they may see uh, through your eyes for a moment to realize that they're, they're headed in the wrong direction. I pray that you would call them to yourselves and, and save them as only you can. And I pray that you would help us to stop making excuses for why we can't. Lord, we, we're so good at excuses. One of the things we're best at. And I pray that you would help us to realize that when you stand, or we stand before you, Lord, that when you ask what we've done with our time, what we've done with the life that you've given us, the words I don't know are not going to be sufficient. And we may not like how that ends at all. Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts, change our attitudes, change our minds, and help us to do what we're called to do. And stop pretending like we don't know what that is. Because your word very clearly told us this morning. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to get together this morning. And to just open and explore your word. We pray that you will invoke a fire in us. That will cause us to come back and get to know the word more and more. That we won't stop. Even when we think we know everything. To realize that we, we know very well. Continue to open our hearts to other people. Continue to help us see people the way that you do. Lord, please forgive us where we fail you. For it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. We give you all the thanks, all the glory, and praise. Amen. Amen.
appreciate y'all being with us this morning. We hope we see you again real, real soon. Until then, God bless you. Amen.